I believe the Lord wants me to send this out because it's so practical in uh, in your daily life or for your daily life. In fact, I think it will really meet a need in each of our lives. Uh, it will deal with this matter of financial freedom. It will deal with this matter of uh, uh, freedom in the family life. It, uh, I believe it will just lay down three basic principles that will really enable you to uh, carry on in the life in a, in a way that uh, you'll be free as a child of God if you uh, practice these three basic principles. Many of you have been following with interest the um, progress of the ministry and especially the part that relate to a building to be built in uh, Texas, Euless, Texas, or around that surrounding area. And I might say that the Lord is uh, continuing to develop that project. The Lord is raising up so much um, in a miraculous way his work through that building. The Lord is um, working on some men's hearts. People are uh, having a part in the building in relationship to a carpet to be put in the building in relationship to paving the uh, parking lot and so on. And Brother Wendell Goodman from uh, Oklahoma City is coming to um, be the administrator over the building and work to coordinate uh, the work in my ministry as well as a couple, a couple other fellows' ministry. By the time you receive this tape, it's very possible that uh, I will have been able to go up and see uh, our grandson. And up to this point, I haven't allowed myself to get too excited about this whole matter, but it seems that it uh, is getting, getting to be an exciting possibility. I trust that the Lord will continue to... Uh, Speak to all of our hearts as we move with his glory. This is Fred Barr, Minister of Music of the West Rome Baptist Church, Brother W.A. Smith, Pastor. We welcome you to the Floyd County Baptist Associational Bible Conference. And this message is recorded on Friday at 7 p.m. June the 23rd, 1978. And our conference speaker is Dr. Manley Beasley. I believe that kind of singing would make a backslidden Episcopalian child. You know, I, I tell you, that uh, sort of categorizes us Baptists, too. But anyway, that's good. That's wonderful. I, uh, I, I appreciate the music. I, I've enjoyed it. In fact, uh, a, brother, a couple of brothers picked me up yesterday in Atlanta, and uh, they had a tape of the services and had the tape of the messages and song, and it was a real blessing. I, I couldn't believe I was coming to church with that kind of singing. So I'm glad that you're blessing us. I, your wife has picked all these this out. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, this is your wife. You keep picking up. You do a good job. These ladies all. <laughs> no, he just said this morning his wife picked that solo out. And I thought it was so good, so I just wondered if she'd pick that out tonight. But I, I really appreciate this choir coming. Uh, when you come to a conference like this, uh, a lot of times it's everybody's responsibility. is no one's responsibility, and very little gets done. And when you haven't, if you haven't done the groundwork before a meeting like this starts, uh, you don't have time after it starts because you don't have time uh, to uh, grow a crowd, I would think that would be a good way of putting it. But uh, 
And so, but this choir's been right here on the ball every time, last night and tonight. And I praise the Lord for it because that, they've added a great deal to to the ministry of these night services. And I praise the Lord for it. If you allow me the liberty tonight, uh, I would like to preach what the Holy Spirit would like for me to preach. Amen. Oh, you would allow me that liberty. <laughs> All right. Amen. I mean, I could have gone ahead and uh, just preached and not shared it with you, but uh, I've had difficulty all afternoon uh, just discovering what the Lord wanted me to preach. And for a number of reasons, but one reason, I slept almost all afternoon. And the second reason is what time I wasn't sleeping, I was on the telephone or eating. And uh, and I say that because... uh, uh, I have to get a lot of rest because of my physical history. Back in uh, 1971, I was down with uh, seven diseases, mixed connective tissue disease specifically, that uh, includes lupus, scleroderma, polymyositis, and the rest, you know, if those three won't shock you, you wouldn't know what the other four were anyway. So uh, it's uh, it's just very rare that uh, that I'm alive, and the Lord has been so good. But I have to rest right, and I really do. And the Lord knows that. So uh, I uh, I usually the well usually the sermons I preach anyway are about uh, 30 years old. I started preparing them 30 years ago. Amen. That's when that's when I got saved, and I've been. And uh, since you're an evangelist, see, you can do that. Amen. You see, you get you don't have, you know, you're not having to get a new sermon every week. So it's, you can just just build on, and that's what I've done for all these years. And uh, so I haven't. Uh, been without preparation for this tonight, but what I'm really saying when I say to you I want to bring what's on my, the Holy Spirit's putting on my heart is that when I got here tonight, I had some plans, but after I got here, I believe the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I want you to share this. And so I want to share um, a message. If I get into a church that that is having some uh, misgivings about finances, I would call this uh, this message uh, a message on financial freedom. If I would get in a church that uh, was having some trouble about not knowing what the life of victory really is, I would say this is a definition of the life of victory. If uh, I'd get in a church like I was in the earlier part of this week, where the pastor would ask me, what is a man of faith? Because a number of years ago, God promised him to get, if he'd get seven men of faith, he'd get seven men of faith that the Lord would uh, do some supernatural things among me, uh, within his ministry. And so he asked me this question. Could you give me a definition of a man of faith? Now, he said, I want you to know I've talked to Carl Bates. I've talked to Herschel Hobbs. And time he got through listing all the people that he uh, had talked to, uh, I looked at him and I said, well, friend, I can only tell you what the Lord's shown me. And, and, and this message defines... What is, or what is a man of faith like, or what is a man of faith? And actually what I'm giving you here, I believe, is three uh, steps. And boy, it's almost a sin for me to say that. I mean, it's very difficult for me to give anyone uh, any steps, uh, because my gift just doesn't allow me to give steps. But uh, there's three steps in relationship to identifying uh, 
the life of victory, the man of faith, or having financial freedom. And the amazing thing about these three different steps that I'm going to deal with, this will work in China as w under communism as well as in Russia under communism, as well as in America that's not under communism, that's totally are living under total different uh, culture. And so not only will this work in the different cultures, but these three different steps will bring you back to the person of Jesus. And we are getting very conscious of principles in our day. And these principles are taking the place for the person of Jesus Christ. Because people said, if you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and you do this, you exercise these principles, put them into operation, you will have this. And that is not so. That's right. Beloved principles are to be the means by which we are brought back to Jesus are the expressions of walking with Jesus. Are the standard by which we can discover, our, actually discover ourselves and be brought back to Jesus, which would relate to what I just got through saying. Principles are never to take the place of Jesus. Never. So, you pray tonight as we deal with this area. And the first, I believe the first step to the life of victory in relationship to being a successful Christian or having financial freedom or having victory wherever you are in whatever you're doing is this. God, having initiated your involvement. If we'd settle that once and for all, beloved, we could see that we could have the glory of God and the power of God and the expression of God in every place in our lives, and that's all you need. I like what James Robinson said to me two years ago. He, God began to deal with in his life, and he said, Preacher, I have prayed that God will take everything out of my life that he did not originate. I never will forget. I, I laugh, but I, I guess I laugh to keep from crying. I just said, well, brother, uh, you're in for some unusual days. But I said, when God gets through with you, you can be assured that he'll stand by you because everything you are involved in, he started. Now, you said, well, give me the scriptural basis for this. Jesus said, and... Brother Jack made reference to this this morning, and I want you to know this is uh, so important. Jesus said, I do nothing except what I see my Father do. I say nothing except what I hear my Father say. Jesus Christ had been given all power in heaven and in earth. And from himself alone, he could have done anything. But beloved, he never did a thing except that which was initiated by the Father. And you can say what you like. Jesus is our example. Even though a lot of people like to set him aside because the fact that he was the Son of God and say that he's not a perfect example, but beloved by his choices, he is a perfect example for every one of us. And Jesus Christ never did a thing except the, what the Father initiated in him. And when he talks about, as the Father has sent me, so send I you, it's in the context of him walking by the Father. And walking by the Father means that 
He walked in such a relationship with the Father that as the Father did things, he did them. As the Lord, the Father said things, he said them. And out of that context, he says, Now as the Father has sent me, so send I you. He did not say, Go out and do this without first saying, I will do it in you. Another outstanding example of this principle that I want to share with you is uh, Paul in Colossians 1.29. Paul said, I labor and I strive. What's the rest of that verse? I labor and I strive according to his workings, what? Which worketh in me mightily. It's obvious, beloved, that God initiated the laboring and striving in Paul's life. Now, I may be wrong, but I, I best I understand this particular verse of Scripture. It came out of the setting of Paul being in jail. And he wasn't running up and down the streets preaching at this time. Really. And I, I really do not know the laboring and the striving he was going through uh, specifically, but it's my opinion that he was uh, praying and sharing the truth of God with the people that came by him. But yet he said, I do nothing except what I hear my father do. See him do and hear say nothing except what I hear him say. In other words, Paul said, I labor and I strive. But it's according to his workings, which what? Worketh in me. In fact, uh, I was amazed the other day. Uh, you know, you really, you really wonder how, how sound some people are, especially some of the younger people that, uh, that are coming up today. The older you get, the more you wonder about some of the kids and you're trusting that God's really teaching them. And the other morning, uh, there was this young man that is uh, Olympic material for weightlifting, and he's the youth director in charge of uh, the athletic uh, division of this particular church. And, and just a young fellow, you know, just handsome, and he's got a lot on the ball. And, and you, I, I just really wondered. I said, now he's got this physical thing down to pet, but let's, I really wonder how he's doing spiritually. And he said, came up to me and he said, you know, Brother Manley, he said, really, what you're teaching us uh, really applies to salvation, doesn't it? He said, if man initiates his approach to God, he said he doesn't get saved. But if God initiates man's approach to God, he says he gets saved. <laughs> I didn't wonder about the depth of that boy any longer. Amen. Because he obviously knew a great deal more about salvation than a lot of people who have reduced themselves to teach that man has an ability to get to God without God initiating. Boy, I tell you that. And see, that so thrilled me because this is the basic, this is the basic foundation for you and me being a successful life. Are building a successful life. Some months ago, I was in a church, and of course, uh, you may start speculating as to what church this is that I'm talking about, but uh, don't let your minds wander too far. It wouldn't help you if you knew. And, uh, but this church was in trouble. This church is still in trouble. And I can think of about five like that right now So that I've been in. And I mean in real trouble. And as I talked with the pastor, I had one question. Who initiated what you're doing? Did you go off to some conference and get inspired by seeing some fantastic work? Or did in the closet at the foot of Calvary where you come to the end? the Spirit of God take the truth of God and give you the revelation of God initiate this whole thing that we see here in your heart where did it start from? you see 
if if what I was talking about had been initiated by God, I could say, friend, you can depend on the fact that if God started it, he'll stick with it. But since I could not find whether or not God initiated this or just plain inspiration, then, friend, I had nothing to say. That's right. People in this world need to realize that God is capable and able and available. He just he's available to initiate what he wants done in the hearts of the believers. And of course a lot of people aren't aware. I guess, but one of the reasons that God is not creating and doing a lot of things in the lives of men and women across this country today is because the key to God initiating things in the heart of a man and woman is the experience of worship. That's where God speaks to people. You just go through the Old Testament and and look to see where God spoke to people. And basically, it was in the experiences of worship. Occasionally, God would just break in on the scene when men were not expecting him and speak to him. He still does it that way. Right? Like Gideon, he did Abraham that way. But most of the time, like in the life of Abraham, when God spoke to Abraham... He just returned to the Lord and got right with God and worshiped God. What? I think one of the most thrilling, well, one of the most profound and yet one of the deepest experiences of my life centers around the fact of my call to preach. Uh, you, you may not know, you... I have no reason to know, I guess. But um, when I started to school as a little boy, I could not learn to read and write. And I never understood why until we discovered this problem in our son about five years ago, I guess. Six years ago. And uh, I, by the time I got to the seventh grade, I was so confused... There was just nothing left for me to do, and that was get out of school. You say, now, Brother Manley, that's wrong. Well, it may be that you're wrong. You know, we don't all, we have to know the facts before we know uh, and make a proper judgment. I just, the only thing I could do was just observe. I could not learn to read or write. And, of course, everyone but my mother said, you're just stupid. You're just dumb. So uh, I started traveling all over the world. And uh, just observing. But one day I met Jesus. And you know, when you meet him, there's a lot of things taken care of. Now, he didn't heal me. But a year later, I surrendered to the ministry. And, uh, and a man, the vice president of a college, a Baptist college, came by and asked the pastor if he had any prospects for college. pastor said no. Oh, he said no. He said no. No, there, I don't. He said, there is one boy. He said, there is a boy in the church that surrendered to the ministry but said, I've never questioned whether God made... I just don't believe God makes a mistake. But I'll tell you, if this boy's right, I am beginning to wonder. And so he said, I, I just see no possibility. The vice president of that college said, well, I'd like to meet him. He met me, and, and he, when he met me, he did not know that I could not read or write. Now, I could put words together, and I could do a little bit. I... I got up and gave a 200-word part in training union one night, and I actually spoke 28 words, and there was not one coherent statement in the whole thing. That's right. Now, you know, that's, uh, it was all ridiculous. The devil said, you'll never make it. Well, this man said, Manley, if you'll come to school and maintain a certain average, he said, you can make it. I prayed my way to school, prayed my way through school. Boy, out later, four years later, came out with a bachelor of science degree. And uh, 
And boy, I just could not uh, read or write anything before I surrendered to preach. So since I was so ignorant, foolish, you know, God just really dealt with me. And I don't tell people about my call to preach because every, every kid in the country would be wanting to be called to preach like I'm called to preach. And I never tell about it, and I'm not going to tell you now. But, uh, but I'll tell you what. Friend, God will move in such a way that it takes to meet your need. And for one solid year, God dealt with me, and I said, I can't preach. I can't preach. And after one year, I surrendered to preach. And after all through these years, at death's door, at, dis at the door of despair, at the door of discouragement, you know what I've discovered? I can take the Father back to that call to preach. And I've told him this several times. I said, now listen. I said, I didn't start this business. You did. And if you're ready to stop, I'm ready, right? Amen. And the moment I get back there to the fact that God started this business, God initiated what I'm doing, God said do this, then beloved, the encouragement, the strength, the wisdom, the courage, everything I need, God started. And if you, you, want, you want to be a man of faith, have financial freedom, have the right kind of marriage, be the right kind of Christian, do those things that God initiates in your life, first and foremost. Then... If you do those things, he initiates. The second step is that you must live in such a way to release God. And we Baptists might be afraid of that word release, so we'll use a little more simple phrase. Let God miraculously work in your situation. In other words, live in such a way that God will miraculously work in your situation. Now, actually, what this does is bring us to the place of faith. In other words, you keep adjusting your life, getting right with the Lord, keep correcting your life, until the Lord Jesus is miraculously, supernaturally working in your life. Keep yielding. There's two things you can do. You can keep yielding, and you can keep trusting. But we should never, never stop. This side of God supernaturally working in our lives. Well, I think you, you take what we're going through right here tonight. This is what we have settled for here tonight. If, beloved, if this is all God wants to do in the world tonight, then my dear friends, something is wrong. You say, well, why isn't it then he's doing all he wants to do? Because, beloved, he's left Abris, he's left man to take dominion. And man is not even inquisitive enough to find out what God wants to do. And then trust him to do it. Jesus said he did not many mighty works because of what? Unbelief. So if you want uh, financial freedom, you want a successful family, marriage, successful work, be a man of faith, then you must surrender so completely to the Lord and then trust Him in such a way that He can supernaturally work in your church. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is not supernaturally working in our lives and supernaturally working in our church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, my dear friends, the children that's reared in your church have no right in this world but to an unbeliever and a hypocrite. And if they grow up to be anything other than an unbeliever, Deny that. It's the mercy of God. It's not us. That's right. 
We have a son that's 13 years old. And, of course, he's getting the benefit of all that we learn out of the others. And uh, he's, uh, he's not perfect. He's just like yours. But uh, he's, uh, but I'll tell you, we've been careful to do a couple, one thing with this boy. We've never let this boy live and die. Come on. And I want you to know something, friend. This kid can trust Jesus while I'm sitting around wondering what's going on. Because he's never been taught to doubt. Now, he is a baby, just a 13 year old kid that's growing up. Pretty big baby, almost six foot. But, uh, but uh, anyway, he is just growing up. But the first step or two in the life of faith, it's things. But finally, when you get to the degree, it's him. And so right now, he's still on things. You know, he's still trusting things, the Lord for things. But I know that he's going to trust him. And so the other day, he had a birthday. And uh, he came to me and uh, I, I said, I tried to find out what he wants. I, I don't t believe people ought to do anything in this world but what they want to do. Come on. You're not sure. But I think your want to's ought to be his. So what you want is right. Some of you were here last night. You knew where I was headed. Didn't you? <laughs> and see, I, I wanted to know what this boy wanted. Because if I could look at what he wanted, I could check and see whether he was right with Jesus or not. If his want-to's was the Lord wants-to's, I knew we could get our want to. Amen. Boy, I tell you. So I said, son, what do you want? He said, a camera. I thought just immediately, well, you can get one about 30 bucks. That'd be all right. He said, well, uh, Daddy, I want one. And when he got through, he was talking about, about $300. And uh, I said, well, uh, I said, well, I'll tell you what, son, why don't you just trust Jesus for one? And I thought I'd have a little argument, you know. I thought he'd say, well, this is my birthday, and you and Mother usually give me something. So I just, I said, but when I said, why don't you trust Jesus for something, he said, okay. And never said a word. And I want you to know, my dear friend, to my amazement. I came about in about two weeks later. And he brought a bag out that looked like a small suitcase. <laughs> and he opened that bag up, and there was a thousand dollars worth of equipment in that bag. And I said, where did that come from? He said, the Lord gave it to me. <laughs> And friend, that boy literally, literally claimed that by faith. Some months ago, we ordained, in fact, almost a year ago, we ordained in Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska, our son that's 22 years old. And he preached. And man, I sat there and I wondered what that fellow was going to say. This kid's never done any, I mean, he's been a perfect, you know, type child. He's better by nature than a lot of people are by grace. And, you know, you know, you see people like that, don't you envy them, don't you? Don't you get full of sin and want to be like they are? Amen? I, I like people like that, but they are getting me upset. But, uh, but anyway, this boy has just been a, a beautiful person all his life. And... Uh, he said, you know, I, he started talking about his mother and myself, and I just wondered what he was going to say. And uh, 
He said, you know, he said, my mother and daddy did not live perfect lives. But he said, I'll tell you one thing they did do. They lived in such a relationship with Jesus that Jesus was supernaturally working in our family. And I knew that Jesus was alive. Boy, I tell you, I want you to know something. God can initiate something in you. But until you claim Him and all of Him by faith to release Him to supernaturally work in that, I'll guarantee you, you'll not get off the ground. And the third step is once you release the Lord to supernaturally work in your situation, then, beloved, you must be sensitive to cooperate with God in that situation. You do not just leave things to God. Philippians 2.13 tells us that it's God that works His will in us. He says it's God that works the will in us to do on His good pleasure. And I want you to know I stumble over that verse of Scripture a long time until I saw that there are two promises in this verse. One is that God will work His will in us. And the second is that God will work His will through us. But, beloved, God does not work His will in us and through us without the cooperation of the will of the believer. And a child of God has two promises here. One is that the Lord will let us know what the will of the Father is. And when we agree with Him, when we agree with Him by surrender and trust, then that releases the Lord to work His will through us. So the Bible calls us a co-laborers. Amen? Co-laborers. In other words, my dear friends, we as believers in Christ Jesus must not only allow God to initiate what we do in our lives, and so trust Him that He's released to miraculously work. But we must stay on our tiptoes, waiting on the Lord. And when I say waiting on the Lord, I'm talking about not sitting down, waiting passively. I'm talking about as a waiter stands beside the table with a towel over the arm, waiting just to see His desire and move out with it. Amen. This uh, this past January, my wife and I flew to Germany to a uh, conference in Germany, uh, European Baptist Convention conference. It's the first uh, conference they ever had on evangelism. It was actually an evangelistic conference, like we have in our states. It's the first one. And so we were going to be in Switzerland for a few days, so they invited me over, since I was going to be over there anyway, you know, drop by and preach. So Martha and I got on the um, airplane, and by the way, my wife's name is Martha, M-A-R-T-H-E. You know, I, I, I say that and people look at me and say, that poor nut doesn't even know how to pronounce his wife's name. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I do. Martha's mother was reading a French novel when she was born and found that name, Martha, and liked it and named her daughter Martha. And I've had to explain it ever since. But, uh, but anyway, we got on the plane, and my secretary had uh, gotten us a first-class ticket. And uh, sometimes, most of the time, if I'm riding over about 30 or 40 minutes, I have to either have a lot of, seat, a lot of room in a seat or either have to ride in first class because... Uh, calcium deposits in my knees to where they, I just can't uh, sit real well at all if I'm going to la tr be on a, in a position for a long time. But this particular trip, 
uh, I felt like that I could uh, handle something less, but my secretary got the first class ticket. And I'll tell you, uh, I stayed mad about halfway from Dallas to New York. But about halfway to New York, I began to get right with the Lord and realize God wasn't broke and, uh, you know, that he could pay the bills. And so uh, I just I let him have it and got to New York and got checked in. And they moved us. They told us since we had first class tickets, it would go up to a lounge up there. And so we went up, got a Coke, got a sandwich, just, just relaxed and watched the beautiful snow. And while we were seated there... Uh, just really realizing, you know, that we were by ourselves for a while and, and going to be by ourselves for about a week. It was a very strange event, after all. And uh, and so we, we were just enjoying everything that was going on. And so a big man started w- walking. He'd walk up by me and he'd turn around and walk back. And I looked at him. He was about 6'6", six, six, and he got my attention, but uh, I didn't uh, think he had anything... You know, I, I wasn't waiting on the Lord. I was sitting there letting the world go to hell. And uh, so that fellow got a little uh, more personal. He sat down by me. And I said to myself, who in the world is this fellow? And you know what? He started talking to me. And he said, uh, he said, where are you headed? I said, Frankfurt. He said, well, I'm headed to Frankfurt. said, do you, uh, uh, you like opera? I said, uh, something like this. Yes, sir. He said, well, uh, he said, uh, would you like to go to opera tonight in uh, Frankfurt? I said, well, I, I don't know. I have time. He said, well, uh, he said, I'm singing there tonight. He said, I can get you tickets. You know, he was just real personal. He wasn't too pushy. I just had to move over. I'd get run over. And I said, about that. And I said, uh, he said, you know, he said, I've got everything in this world that a man would want. And then he began to get personal. And... Uh, he said, man, said, but I'm the most miserable man in the world. And I thought to myself, you know, this fellow's nuts. Here he is, you know, just laying it out. And uh, he said, you know, I've really been miserable for about six, seven years. He said, about six, seven years ago, a man by the name of Bill Wright led me to a, to a decision. And he said, uh, here, he said, you know, I've been so miserable, said, I need some help. He said, uh, he said, by the way, what do you do? <laughs> I'm this happy. Now, let me tell you something, friend. The Holy Spirit for 15 minutes, right, was wanting me to have that man. But I'll tell you what, God almost had to run over me to even get me sensitive enough to respond to that thought. Now I want you to know that's not the way it's supposed to be done. I'll tell you, we as God's children, if we're going to see, be men and women of faith, if we're going to see the victory, we're going to see the glory of God, we're going to have to learn how to allow God to initiate what we do. We're going to have to learn how to trust Him to supernaturally work in that situation. And we're going to have to learn how to be sensitive and obedient to God in that situation. And you know what? It's just like here in a few minutes. An offering will be taken. And you know what we'll do? We'll not allow God to tell us what to do. Do you know when I go to a church for revival and they, they, they do not... Seek the face of God about a thing like that. Do you know I'll never go back? That's right. You know why? Because, my dear friend, listen. Until God's people learn how to uh, learn how to discover and allow God to initiate what they do, they'll never go as Christians. That's right. They'll never grow. You will not grow. I won't go. I noticed that I uh, mentioned about that offer, and it got a few uh, uh, little talks and whispers. But, friend, I'll tell you what, i got news for you. I never ask any man, any woman, any person, anywhere in the world to do anything but accept what God wants you to do. And if that's wrong, then you can talk all you want. Amen? Is there anything wrong with that? Come on. That's all I've preached tonight. 
If you want to be a man of faith, you want to be a successful Christian, you just like people say you shouldn't borrow money or you should borrow money, should be debt free. Listen, if God initiates something within you to borrow a million dollars and you can trust God to release him supernaturally in that and you can cooperate to bring, to uh, move with God, I've got news for you. That is financial freedom. Amen. And um, I trust that some way, somehow, the Lord will let you see tonight that uh, what God initiates, He stands by. And He stands by with all the supernatural power there is to miraculously work in that situation. And He stands by to make Himself known to enable you to accomplish exactly what he's designed for you. Well, this helped me. So I started praying, Lord, take everything out of my life that you didn't start. And Lord, not only take everything out of my life you didn't start, but everything you started that I'm not sure of, help me to know that you started Amen. And give me the grace to trust you so you can supernaturally work in the things you started. And make me sensitive, Lord, so you just, just whisper and I'm available to do whatever you want me to do. To go and say whatever you want me to go and say. And I trust tonight that the Lord will deal with you about this. I think one of the things that really got my heart about this was that I have had to work with a number of pastors that have called and said, we're in trouble. Where do we go from here? And they could not say that God told them what to do. No wonder they couldn't have any faith. No wonder they could not trust the Lord. No wonder they were in trouble. Right? Would you bow your heads with me, please? Lord Jesus, and Lord, I believe with all my heart that many of us have got into involvements, into situations that... Uh, we do not know whether you started it or not. And it's confusing. So, Lord, we ask in you to make yourself known, powerfully known. Powerfully known. Powerfully known. Lord, to each of us that we might obey you. Lord, we're not interested in man doing anything in this world but what you want done. And, Lord, you know that's hard for even this crowd to believe that tonight but Lord Jesus I pray you'll help them know that in Jesus name Amen